Aren't you glad that there's someone that loves you? Even in your rebellion, even in your sin, there is someone that loves you because they truly understand you. And we have the opportunity as brothers and sisters in Christ, that love that we've received, to love everyone else by that same love and experience. I am so grateful for the love of God. He has no respecter of persons. He loves everybody. In their sin, out of their sin, he loves them. But we know that he came, Jesus came, even while we were yet sinners. That did not prohibit God from loving us. I am so grateful that I can depend on that love to carry me through in the troubles in our worlds. That love is a sustaining love. It's not a temporary love, but it's a sustaining love. We are sustained by the love of God. And Father, we praise you. We bless you. We thank you. We magnify you. We exalt you because there is nothing that we can do or have done that reserves that kind of love. Father, bless us now as we share the living word of God. We pray that you'd give us clarity of thought, clarity of speech, that no person under the sound of my voice would misunderstand the word of God, but that they would receive it with gladness in their hearts. That was then, this is now. Our scripture text is found in the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, verses uh, 3 to 9. Uh, the author of Hebrews, there's a lot of controversy about who wrote the book of Hebrews. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It was all inspired by the Spirit of God. And it's contained in the book of God and of God's dealings with his people. We shall begin reading, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and the gift of the Holy Spirit according to his own will was not the will of man, but it was the will of God that we take on the nature of God, that we take on God's spirit and his character. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under his feet, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all the things put under his feet. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every one of us. It was not God's plan and God's purpose that we die. We're all free will beings. It was our choice to choose death over life. And we still have the opportunity as we live and breathe, Christian and non-Christian, to choose whether we choose life or whether we choose death. Everyone who's ever read the Word of God 
has reviewed the birth of the church in the book of Acts. There on that day, there was a shaking. There was a shift in the atmosphere. These people who had gathered, believing, trusting God for the power that was promised them on that day of Pentecost, God changed and forever changed the world. On that day, they were filled with the power and presence of God. The Holy Spirit came down, and the language that scattered the people in the account in the book of Genesis, when man was trying to reach God, by his own sinful heart. And God confused them with other languages. Think about that for a moment. But on the day of Pentecost, God gathered the people with those same languages into a relationship, into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Language confused. Language brought unity. When these people emptied out their hearts, God was able to fill it with his presence. And God is not going to fill any contaminated vessels. We have to empty ourselves in order to be filled with his presence. And nobody's hearing me. <laughs> when you read the books of Acts, it was quite evident that the believers were with Jesus because they had the ability to perform miracles, physical miracles and spiritual miracles. They were able to heal the sick in the name of Jesus. They were able to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. And the word of God was magnified and increased because of their passion. And some would claim that uh, it was the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was the gift of tongues. It was the gift of languages that identified them uh, as being true believers, and I disagree with that. It was the power and the authority of the presence of God and the written word. It wasn't the fact that they spoke in tongues that was the evidence of the presence of God in them. It was the authority and the power that God gave them. And it was in that power and in that authority that identified them with Jesus Christ. And nobody made a mistake whether or not they were with Jesus or not because the same spirit that was in Jesus Christ was the same spirit that was in them. And they did great works. They had great evidence of God's presence. And people recognized that they had been with Jesus. People didn't have to guess whether or not they had been with Jesus. All they had to do is be in their presence and observe their conversations. Hello. That they knew that these had been with Jesus. The fire of Pentecost burned with such fervent he lighting the path of salvation to as many as believed and received the word of God. The author is reminding every believer of the tremendous worth of our redemption by Jesus Christ. There is no greater convincing evidence than the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us salvation. And heaven said, Amen. Amen. It is in that that we are saved today. 
if it wasn't for his birth, if it wasn't for his death, if it wasn't for his burial, if it wasn't for his resurrection, we would not have any hope. The author is reminding us of that experience in the birth of the church. Well, that was then. This is now. Our churches are filled with chameleon, chameleon Christians. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? It's very difficult for the world to see a difference in us. But I tell you, any person that has been filled with the Spirit of God, there is a distinct difference with that person. You see, we have fallen away from truth. We have fallen away from God. And we've taken upon the, the, the wisdom of this world, the understanding of this world. We have taken upon their philosophy and we begin to think like them, and we begin, we begin to behave like them, and we begin to act like them. You see, here's a true way of seeing what's inside of you. When you get into a fix, you know, something happens. Something disturbs your peace. An event, a situation. If what comes out of you is cursing and blasphemy, then the Spirit of God, I have a question about whether or not you are possessing the Spirit of God. Whatever is in you is going to come out of you at an appropriate appointed time. So if it's easy for you to curse than to bless God, I question whether you've had a genuine experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And heaven said, Amen. You see, there are evidences of the Spirit of God that resides within the believer. And part of it is love and, and joy. And, and if something happens and you're in relationship with Jesus Christ, well, you could say, well, praise God. You, you know, you know you're, you're, you're praising him anyway. You're not praising him for the situation that happened. But out of your heart, you are praising God because you still have your life. You escape an incident. You escape tragedy. So get in the habit, my brothers and sisters, of praising the Lord. The more you praise him, the easier it is to praise him. But what happens is that we get so familiar with rubbing shoulders with people in the world until we take on their habits. And there is no differentiation between you and them. God is the difference in our lives, brothers and sisters. The world speaks with the spirit of hopelessness. Hello. You hear it all over the world. People are speaking the spirit of hopelessness. We speak with the spirit of hope, rather with the assurance that God is with us even in our calamities. Is God with you? You see, we failed to bring healing to this country by not applying the scriptures as we were challenged and encouraged to apply it. 
We become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. I'm sure you're familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14. You probably have heard it and 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 are tiring, tiring of hearing it. But it's true. The Word of God is infallible. Regardless of your circumstances or the situation that you are confronted with or me or, or, or me or I am confronted with, the Word of God is infallible. It is what it is and it says what it says and it means exactly what it means. There is a call for the people of God to repent. to humble themselves, to fast and pray, and to seek the face of God. Turn from our wicked ways. Let me tell you this. Hold on. Hold on. The government is not responsible for the healing of the land. God is waiting for us to take responsibility as believers. You see, that word spoken was never to unbelievers. My people who are called by my name, are you called by the name of God? Humble themselves. Seek my face. Repent. Forsake your wicked dealings. Seek my face. Then you will hear from heaven. And the promise is that, that we receive is that he will heal the land. You see, we've heard of that scripture. We've heard of it again and again and again. But how many of us have been faithful in that scripture? The Lord is getting quiet in the earth. You have to. If you want change to happen, if you want healing to occur in this nation, then you will do exactly what the Word of God says. Hello. You see, we have to take personal responsibility to this, to the situation that we're living in. We have to take personal responsibility. God did not give His Spirit of authority and power to unbelievers. He gave it to believers. He gave us power in the Spirit of God. He gave us authority in the Word of God. And for us not to exercise that power and that authority, it handicaps us from seeing God's glory and seeing the work of God in people's lives. It is the people who have been called by his name are responsible to intercede for those that don't believe, for those that don't know the Lord. The charge is upon us. You praying yet? Are you saying, Lord, help him get through this message? <laughs> I'm tired of hearing it. We are responsible. We've got to take personal responsibility. You see, the enemy comes to divide and conquer. And what happens as opposed to holding up the Word of God before the people, we will hold up our political parties and bring division in the church, and people are fussing and, and arguing, and 
God have mercy on us. Christian Democrats, Christian Republics, Republicans, Christian Independents, fussing and clamoring when the word is very clear that we are to what? Hmm? Yeah, we're, we're to repent. We're to see God's face. We're to turn from our wicked ways. We're to humble ourselves. The first thing is that we humble ourselves. And that's a great challenge, isn't it? To humble ourselves. Well, the first way you start humbling yourself is through fasting. Uh-oh. Well, I'm on medication. I can fast. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because God is ordering it. And God will sustain you in the fast because you're fasting unto him. Sometimes you, you forget about meals. Well, I haven't eaten all day. Because you're so caught up, you're so busy in other things. But when we fast, we fast to the Lord, and we spend time in, in prayer and preparation of our hearts for God's instructions, for his divine intervention. And we're standing at the, the brink, as it appears, the brink of disaster, the collapse of a country. You see, Jesus said it very clearly, very well. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I'll go a step further. A country divided against itself cannot stand. And heaven said, amen, pastor. There's no way that we could stand divided. And that is the work of the enemy, to divide and conquer. So that the people can fuss and fight instead of looking to the Lord in earnest. Petitions, asking God for his divine intervention. Is it too late to pray? Is it too late to seek the Lord? Is it too late to turn the tide? And heaven said no. God listens to his children when we meet the condition, when our hearts are right. Now, we can do it voluntarily, or God can apply the pressure. You see, it's really, it, it's, I, I'm, you know, I'm, it just blows my mind that people think that there is no change in our atmosphere. There, there's no change in the world at large. For example, there are people that don't believe in global warming. And they are just thinking about where they live. Take a view of the world at large, and you will see the transition that has taken place because of us, human beings, destroying what God has created for gain, for greed. And of course, the powers that be who are in control with the finances and monies, and they're saying, oh, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as global warming. As long as their pockets are filled, as long as they're secure, well, well they don't have to believe that. They don't have to receive that because they're depending upon what they have and not what others have or don't have. Our world 
has changed and our world continues to change. And we stand here with three candidates, maybe one we don't even recognize or qualify, for the greatest responsibility of, of our country. I want you to know today that there is no man, no woman that can fix this. And I don't care who they are to say that I can fix this. That's a lie from the pit. Nobody can fix it but Jesus. Nobody can begin to fix it but the people of God as they are in obedience with the Word of God. We're the interceders. Jesus intercedes for us. We intercede for the people. And now we stand confused whether we take an apple with two worms or an apple with three worms. <laughs> we got to choose one or the other or not choose at all. And I pray that you will get your knife out, whichever apple you choose, get your knife out and carve away all those things that the worm has eaten and eat the apple. <laughs> as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. We're led by the Spirit of God. We're led not by popular opinion. We're led by the Spirit of God through His Word. That is what keeps us in perfect peace because our minds are stayed on the Word of God regardless if the wind blows or the earthquakes or the ocean rises. Our hope is in the Word of God. You see, we're going to live or die one way or the other. We're going to go to heaven or not go to heaven. There's no, there is no purgatory. There's nothing in between. We either are going to give our hearts to the Lord, we either are going to turn to the Lord with all of our hearts, or not. But I believe that if you pray, and hopefully the whole world the whole known Christian world is praying. While we pray, the enemy is plotting. But we pray throughout the Spirit of God will bring a check in the hearts of the believers and lead them and guide them. Because we're people who walk not by sight, but we are people who walk by faith. And that faith is not in a governmental system, a corrupt governmental system, but that faith is in the eternal Word of God that will be here long after we've been off the scene. There's a lot of brothers and sisters who have gone to their resting place and guess what? The Word of God is still the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. We are people who are supposed to give the world hope. But if we've lost our hope, if we lose the essence of our salvation, if we neglect our salvation, what else is there to give someone other than your opinion? What? was it that changed your life that caused you to be a Christian? Was it the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that did it? 
You see, God gives people opportunity to come to him through the preaching of the word of God to the believer, unbeliever, that as we receive the word of God, we respond to it. We accept it. Don't be deceived. No man or woman or government is going to fix this. We are the people of God, the possessors of eternal hope, the possessors of the living word. We are not to operate in fear, but in hope and confidence in serving a faithful God who blesses his people when they obey. As the song poet says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay when he shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, hallelujah, may I then in him be found dressed, not like this, but in his righteousness stand and stand faultless before his throne. On Christ, I stand all of the ground. Is sinking sand. We have been called to give people hope, and that hope alone is in the living word. Let's not be twisted. There is no person who will meet our needs to fill this office. They're not going to be in our need. But I have something to tell you that really will support you. Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Chapter 4, verse 19, he says, My God shall supply all of your need in Christ Jesus according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's the one that's going to meet your need. So as you go to the polling place, maybe you voted already. Uh, my prayer is that God will, will lead you and direct you, and guess what? It's all up to God to do what he desires to do, but we have a part to play. I pray that your conversations will be turned from the political realm into the realm of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Is there anyone here that has not made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ who wants to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus came and, and died and was raised from the grave, we are saved. If we believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are saved. Let's stand. Father God, we bless your people. And Lord, we know that you have a purpose for everything under the sun. And Father, when we are at that place that we could only look to you 
Father, we pray that you'd shine your light that would lead us and guide us into a clear path. And Lord, may the sweet communion and the power of the Holy Ghost rest upon your people and may their words have fruit in them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.